Welcome to the People I Know, a philosophical podcast with and about the diverse people I know and love uh, as an African American thinker, academic, dancer, all kinds of stuff. Today's guest is Lisa Christopher Kingsley, uh, owner of San Diego Pole Dance Academy. Uh, Enjoy. Hi, I'm Lisa Victoria. Um, my full name is Lisa Victoria Piscopo. So I think some people think Victoria may be my last name. It's just more of my stage name that's carried over to uh, real life and pole because the two are uh, pretty much the same. I am a mom, wife, a studio owner, a uh, competition organizer. Um, I choreograph for a competition team and a dance company um, and just do whatever my heart calls me to do because I am a slave to that. Not always do I want to do those things, but when it calls, I have to go and then it's just a ride. So yeah, all of the titles. <laughs> and it used to be competitor, maybe future competitor when mom life calms down, so. Okay, I'm gonna put a pin in that because I definitely like to come back around to that. Um, so this particular uh, season, I really want to call it something else, but um, it's sticking for right now. So this season is the mixed fix I know. Um, officially, you are my first uh, conversation. So um, if I get the silly question out of the way first, what kind of mix are you and why does that matter? Yeah, okay. So what kind of mixed chick am I? So I am... Uh, in a nutshell, Dominican, Scottish, Sicilian, um, and Black. And then to like break that down, my biological father was Dominican and Black. And then my biological mother was Scottish or is Scottish and Sicilian. Um, and I think it matters because for such a long time, I was told it didn't. Um, I'm the only brown person in my family. So to my family, it was just, this is Lisa. Um, and there was a lot of identity questions I had and really big question marks hanging over my head and around the world that I lived in growing up. Um, so I think it does matter. And with raising my son, uh, he is mixed, even though he looks pretty light skinned. Um, he is mixed and that's something, his heritage, his culture, his ethnic background, his race, that's something that's very, very important uh, for me to share with him and for him to go on his own journey with and for him to know where he comes from because I didn't get that growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, because it's something that I honestly, as your friend, kind of forget. Um, you were, because you said you're the only brown person in your family, but it's like, so you yeah. kind of adopted <laughs> you were raised by yeah. other people and you don't have to go too far into that it's no just, it's okay so questions. yeah I was adopted by my grandparents so it's kind of like if you know someone who comes from a, a society might say a dysfunctional or non-traditional family background then you kind of understand it but for people who don't um and my family is kind of crazy like it's a big mix so my uh, grandparents adopted me from my biological mom because she was uh, incarcerated in Rikers Island when I was born. So they got a surprise phone call that their daughter had given birth uh, in jail and that they could come get me or I could go into the system. And from what I've pieced together, my biological dad was a drug dealer and he um, was out of the picture and had uh, been killed or what have you. Uh, when I was born. So they took me and my biological grandparents, I identify and call them as a uh, mom and was dad, he's passed away. And then my biological mom, I refer to her as Lisa. Um, so there's like some feelings around calling her mom, but out of respect for Hazel and what the truth is for my upbringing, she's just Lisa to me. Then her sister and brother are really my aunt and uncle. <laughs> but I call them my brother and sister because I came home to be with them from like three days old. So everyone just gets a bloodline. It's still there. But then as far as the label goes, it gets like bumped a little yeah. bit. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. That'll, that'll be really fun for you and your son to uh, make a family yeah. tree. It has to be a different type of tree. Like. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a project that they have kids do in school. And it was so traumatizing for me. They have you make okay. a family tree. I swear I was the only one in elementary school 
and I called it like my mixed up family tree and I was just traumatized because I, it was, I was different and I went to a very small elementary school and I just uh, was still learning about my history and where I came from. So I think my mom still has that or it's in this garage somewhere. Uh, <laughs> call Lisa Gigi with Cyric. So it works. Uh, it works for us. We finally gave her a label. So, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and why does being mixed, why doesn't it matter? Or um, when doesn't it? Matter? Yeah. So I think it doesn't matter because I'm human. You know, I'm, I'm a human being. Um, and I think that it doesn't matter because for me, in the way that my husband has been in my life and loved me for so long from such a young age, it's never mattered to him, although he's seen how it matters to other people and it matters to me. Um, mm. Because I'm human mm. and I, I am who I am, I can't change that. I'm part of society. I'm a mom. I'm just like everybody else. Um, but how how you fit into everyone else's world, I think that's kind of why it matters. It's a little mm -hmm. bit of a piece of why it matters, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm thinking back on the conversation I was having with um, uh, an old friend who's a pastor now. And yeah. so that was the second episode. <laughs> it's like. You know, talking with him, he he was saying how you know people, of course, see this. They see you know his collar, and they assume all kinds of things that he has this identity, or that's how he fits into their world. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, it's like that's not how I came up with him. That's not how I know him, or that's not necessarily how he knows himself. Well, of course, it's how he knows himself. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, how, you <laughs> how it fits in, how it fits too. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's the case with other identities as, as well. I mean, genetic or otherwise. Yeah, I think it's funny because I think depending on um, like the ecosystem or the community that you're part of, it matters more or sometimes mm -hmm. like it doesn't even matter at all. Um, mm -hmm. And being part of the pole community, it matters very, very differently than it matters when I'm a mom, especially mm -hmm. a mixed mom. Mm -hmm on a playground with a light-skinned white baby, uh, you know, looking younger than most of the moms in our neighborhood, assume I'm the nanny. Um, and there's actually a hashtag that's like a joke one. I can't remember it specifically, but I think it's like moms that look like nannies. Uh, and I saw that and just left up. Like, no, I'm not for hire. I'm not watching your child. Um, so it's funny how the color of your skin or how you identify and who you are as a human on the outside affects different communities and different facets of your life. Yeah. Yeah. I had not considered that as being a thing. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. On behalf yeah. of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Mm hmm. They're like, oh wow, you're so good with him. Are you are you taking on a nanny share? And I was just like, wait, I'm his mom. And she's like, oh really? I'm like, mm, I'm his mom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Crazy. I do not have actually. That might lead me right into the next question. <laughs> yeah, hello. Wow, your relationship. <laughs> What is your relationship with philosophy and critical thinking? We can start with the critical thinking part. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, an obvious question. I think if I if I hear this as like from my mom's perspective or from some other folks I know, it's like, how do you not backslap somebody? Like, how do you not snap in situations like that? Yeah. Where someone's questioning your relationship to your child, and, and this isn't, you know, you're not alone in this. I've heard of these kinds of of, of experiences with others for other reasons mm -hmm. with mothers like no or fathers this yeah. is my child I, what, how dare you question that yeah. that bond that relationship that existence um I think the like number one thing for me is my mom because she had to go through it not necessarily mm. are you the nanny um but similar because she is the small petite white redhead from Scotland um, and especially when her and my 
biological grandfather, who's my father, were alive. Um, it was, oh, is she adopted? This is a foreign exchange student. Oh. <laughs> you know, trying to trying to grasp so that they felt comfortable understanding why someone different than them was with them. Um, mm-hmm. And seeing how composed she was and how um, grounded she was through just responding with them and her just lack of letting them steal her joy and penetrate her light I think now that I'm a mom it was more so to protect me because Mm. being in those situations it's all fronts are to protect Siric all fronts are to make sure that my son is not affected negatively and that his joy is not stolen um Mm. and on the other side of that it's just I've dealt with it a lot (laughs) I've dealt with it more than uh, I would like to. And it's just not a surprise anymore. It's yeah. not, yeah. It was for a while, but now it's just, it's not a surprise anymore. And then because it's so common, uh, not that I make excuses for people, but I try to understand where they're coming from so then I can educate and it's not my job to educate. Um, but if I care more, then maybe I'll start a conversation with them or, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there are times <laughs> I want to slap a bitch. Like, I was born in Queens and I am Dominican uh, and I was raised in DC, like outside of DC. So there are some times that I just want to look at people and be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, yeah. But I have, uh, I, my husband says that uh, it's best for me to avoid confrontation at all costs. <laughs> so I try to, because the passion, once it comes out, it's hard to put a cork back on it. So mm-hmm. yeah, and I just don't have time for like dumb people with closed minds when I'm on the playground or like living my life, you know? Yeah. If I care yeah. enough. And it's someone in my circle, like I'll reach out and have conversations with them and start conversations if they say ignorant things. Um, mm-hmm. But you have an opportunity to perhaps open both eyes and open your mind. And if you don't take that opportunity, then I just don't need you to be in my life anymore. Um, mm. Yeah, especially growing up in like the South, it was, uh, it's so hard, especially with some family members from my side and Christopher's side on both sides, just um, having conversations about certain hot button topics, you know, so. And that leads me to um, kind of draw this in with philosophy, whether you know it or not, Um, you know, traditional, a very classic platonic philosophy is all about having conversations. It's all about like, let's talk these things out, let's talk about these ideas to figure out was, you know, <clears throat> talk in circles about these theories and all of that. And so from a philosopher's standpoint, you do that because that's, that's the best thing to do. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my cynical self really wants to say, like, we just want to sit and stroke our egos. So I'm yeah. going to sit and talk to someone who wants to sit and talk to me. Of course, there's more to it. But like from a person, yeah. from just a human yeah. standpoint, of uh, from a mother standpoint, from, you know, any of these things, it's like, well, no, there's some something to be gained more broadly yeah um I mean, you, you, you kind of spoke on that like do you feel that that okay yes I'm improving the world just a little bit I'm helping out these ignorant yeah. people and not ignorant as in like they're bad they just don't know yeah especially as a mom I know how I want to influence and help raise Siric. um so I think on the other side of that you're thinking is going to get passed down or influence your child's thought process. So depending on the age also, it, those, it might just be words and your child won't understand any of that, but it gets to a certain point where your child hears things and then they replicate. So then that ignorance gets passed on to your child. Um, so there are moments where, yeah, like I do give a damn and it does matter and I'll have conversations. Um, and I love talking to people. I have an open line of communication. Um, it's just my, I can be a bit, 
unfiltered at times and <laughs> a little more bold and abrasive with my approach I've been told um uh -huh. so yeah no I love maybe wine helps if we have a talk over wine uh but no I love talking with people about like why or like I want to know their why because I know why, I know my why but I want to know their why and like why is this your first assumption or why are you thinking this way um mm -hmm. I run into conversations now where I've really pushed people that I would really love for them to stay in my life I've pushed them to know their why like why mm -hmm. did you make this comment why did you think this comment was okay when it's racially charged or it's hurtful and when someone tells me no I'm I'm not going to take it back. Um, it's just, I just don't have room for ignorance in my life like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone else would sit longer in it, but I probably have a mess I have to go clean or an email I have to answer. So. <laughs> Not a better thing to do. <laughs> Lots of wiping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wiping everything. Dogs, babies, floors, poles, everything stages everything you've wiped <laughs> good um as far as see what i have written down here are your your motherhood but i want to talk about poll yeah. <laughs> and i know that a lot, of, a lot of people want to hear about that as well and maybe not in the way that people think they're going to hear about it i don't know um but as far as um both critical thinking and philosophy how do you think they can tie into poll. I mean, I certainly have my answer for you, like witnessing you as a studio owner, yeah. instructor, coach, and performer and dancer trainer. Like <laughs> for sure, I see how kind of your perspective, how your outlook and just how yeah. you have to be present in certain kinds of ways, how those tie in. But I wanna know from you, how do you feel that philosophy and or critical thinking tie into your work in the poll world? Oh, yeah. Pole is everything to me. So um, I have such a strong attachment to pole in all aspects that it fills my life because it, it literally saved me. Um, I don't share like my pole is my savior story very often just because I'm not like, I'm not the highlight at the studio. That's not why I'm there. Um, to be relatable, yes, 100%. But um, pole saved me from an eating disorder, from suicidal and self-harm tendencies. Um, and like the list goes on into bad habits. So the, the thing for me with pole is it's my everything. So I guard it and protect it because I know what it can mean to an individual. Um, so over the years, it's definitely changed because the more experience you get with something, hopefully the more um, you just get better at it and the smoother you get at it, you know? Mm. So with pole for me, I protect my practice. Um, I protect my business. It's all a very fine balance between like logic and emotion. And with pole, I think the two go hand in hand, they're separate, but then at the end of the day, the lines are very, very blurred uh, mm -hmm. because I do in a business. So business me won't always agree with what like maybe the instructor side of me will do or like the coach side of me. So, or not necessarily agree, but as an instructor, I know if I was only an instructor, I wouldn't handle business situations a certain way. If I was only a coach, I wouldn't handle classes a certain way. So I've definitely had to keep an open mind and be resilient with uh, my interactions between wearing the different hats in the business, between interacting with my students and my staff um, and just the whole world at large. And for the most part, I just tend to stay in my own bubble for the most part. I just, I really like it there. Uh, might be a control issue and like a control freak, but control <laughs> uh, stems from trauma. So that like logic and emotion have to mm -hmm. find a balance. And with COVID, it's impossibly hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think, which do you think is more important? Um, oh. Business, the business hat or the creative hat? Oh, 100% the creative half. 
I can give it a, <laughs> I give two fucks less about the business half, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, it's clearly like one has to feed the other or one has to influence yeah. they influence one another. Yeah. yeah but you so, know, so I'm sitting watching witnessing the studio and what you know you or your students are doing, it's like, well, clearly there's a direction in every studio should have it. So you yeah. have some direction creatively for your space, but you also yeah. have to run it. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like it's the business half, it's like a double-edged sword. So without the business, the creativity could not exist. Um, and that wasn't always the case at the beginning. When you first open, you're in survival mode. You are just trying to survive. You're trying to pay all of the bills, figure out how this like art form uh, can become a career because everyone's telling you you're crazy and you're going to fail. Um, so you're just you're in survival mode and you just have to do what you have to do to like pack classes so my strategy as far as the business goes when you're first starting off is to fill a void in the market so if you fill a void in the market then that lends you um demand and drive from clientele which then stems from uh, financial resources that you can then support what your true passion is and very rarely i think uh, the void and your passion are probably not the same thing. <laughs> so being a creative artist um, and a mover, you want to share your passion, but that's probably what's not going to pay the bills at first. So mm -hmm. you have to build a community from the business. And I've never looked at students as dollar signs. We'll never recommend something to someone that will waste money to them because um, money is a very precious resource. Um, so, and for some people, they spend their whole paycheck outside of, you know, their basic, uh, like their basic survival and livelihood goes to poll because polls are everything. So yeah, without the business, you can't have the money to do the creative resources, but then, um, sometimes the creativity just won't pay the bills. So you have to find a balance. And I, I always try to analyze the market or my, our ecosystem and see, what do they actually need? How can I keep the lights on? And how can I run a business off of what people need? Not just, mm -hmm. I know this will fill, I know this will make money. Because um, mm -hmm. I could do that in any job and then probably be unhappy. So, yeah, <laughs> which is actually what I kind of wanted to ask. Like, do you, do you think if you had to, could you do this in some other like field? What do you mean? <laughs> Not pole. <laughs> Not pole. <laughs> Would I still be pole dancing? <laughs> I'm so confused. Like, pole doesn't exist? I'm so like, wait. Right. Like, I'm trying to think of the, the circumstances under which pole would be. Like, I have a job, but I still pole. pole? Or, like, what? I'm like, what's going on? I'm going to you. <laughs> this is never mind. That's a weird world. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm honestly, I think that uh, if I were to turn off all of the emotions and all of, God, it'd be so nice at times. Jesus. <laughs> amen. amen yeah if I can turn everything off and just uh go on autopilot 100 probably because the feelings and the passion and the emotions and being so uh being such an empath and tapped into everything I feel that's what mm -hmm. that's what drives me that's what drives the studio that human experience um my best friend always jokes she's like you could run a big company because you're such a like a hard ass if you wanted to but I don't know I don't know yeah, yeah I, I, like <laughs> I like being in sweatpants and like half naked don't really have like the <laughs> underwire situation it's not really for me you know and like the little like, three two inch heels what are those fuckers I can't <laughs> underwire <laughs> situation no it's gonna be a no the, the dress code <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah. I want costumes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking, yeah, I, I threw my last bra with underwire because I put it on and I was like, fuck this shit. <laughs> this is not. <laughs> this is I not actually the world. did that for a couple months. When we had moved to Denver, I got like a corporate job for a couple months uh -huh. and I hated it. I, I mean, we left, we like had to leave. I quit that job. I hated it. Even just, uh, 
being stuck at a desk, what it did and locked up my body and not having access to uh, move whenever I wanted to, the freedom that I've given myself with making my own career path, I don't think I could find that someplace else. Yeah. yeah. It would be hard. Mm-hmm. And then also just like their eating habits, like, uh, like is this organic? <laughs> <laughs> like I can't, it's really hard to uh like the meal prepping thing it was just another thing to do in my day at the end of the day yeah. when I wasn't happy the last thing I want to do is cook and eat healthy food I'm like give me some fucking cookies and chips like yeah <laughs> no I just couldn't do it no yeah yeah oh my gosh I don't know how far into this we are but if for anybody listening or watching who is not sure about what the hell we're talking about yes we were talking about pole dance like the poles that are vertical from floor to ceiling where you dance in really cool ways and do awesome things yeah. flying through the air if you didn't know and you don't know now you know <laughs> I, I just think pole it's its own entity that's all in yeah. casting and everyone always yeah. knows my phone knows because it corrects it capital p uh yeah but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuller. <laughs> yeah fuller. uh but i i know like i'm still out of touch with people outside of the pole community yeah. uh, and my own little community that i just yeah i'm like oh like pole dancing you know pole dancing yeah <laughs> i don't know like mom's in the playground uh oh, i don't like run through the playground screaming i'm a pole dancer but i don't not tell them because if you're going to mm-hmm. be in my life it's such a huge part of it that you can't, uh, yeah, you can't be a Karen. <laughs> no, <Yeah>. thanks. <laughs> so talking a bit more about that huge part and, and some of the fun stuff with it, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to converse with you, and I didn't bring this up the other day, but the fun stuff um, is that, you know, you are, um, I don't want to call you <laughs> a sex activist. No, you are all about like healthy um you know, a healthy sexual activity and thoughtfulness and um, awareness and um, the word, the, the fancy new angle word for that is just flying out of my head, but um, what is it? sex positive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just being okay. sex positive. Um, and so that, how that translates in your full classes um, is with a lot of, you know, exotic style dancing. And um, I don't necessarily want to get into the all of the sex worker stuff that goes along and I don't want to say drama but um yeah uh, things that people really need to be aware of right yeah. now because it's a philosophical podcast and we can yeah. talk about all that stuff at another time but um you do a lot of you know really sensual sexy personally freeing stuff and yeah. it is really important um and I was just wondering if you can speak a bit to why you have found that so important, not only for you, but also the students, um, because there's definitely some like philosophical whatnot in there. Yeah, um, I've always been mm, a sexual person. Uh, even from like being a little child, I was like grinding up against things like, oh, this feels good, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like grinding and just just like it's like okay and now I just grind for a a career but no I've always been a very sexual person and um intrigued with what that means and where that comes from and like how those sensations tap into your body and how um your your emotions can affect your sex life or and like with yourself or a partner um, and I was in school to be a sex therapist. So it probably goes hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. I was studying psychology and I was just obsessed and loved um, the sex therapy side. And then whole um, through just lots of movement and also yoga, because the yoga style that I got into is more, um, it's more fluid, it's more flow based. Um, so just like the touch and the sensation establishes an open line of communication. And those are things I'm very, very um, passionate about. And I think I push that, not push that, but I bring that up in classes. So to have Mm -hmm. an open line of communication with me and your body, so do a body scan, how are you feeling? All of that relates to what you do in your own personal sex life. 
Um, and if you can't touch yourself, how are you going to get to know your body better? Um, Cause for me first, it's relationship with your own body for yourself. Mm. Sex for me is not, uh, I'm not like sex positive so I can please my partner. I don't pull so I can, I have never really done anything <laughs> for anyone else except for like myself, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that they, it just, it is. I felt such shame. Uh, mm growing up in not a super religious family, but, um, you know, I went to Catholic school for a couple of years and they talk about like masturbation and God's always watching. And then you feel shame, like, oh my God, did he see what I did? Um, mm. And I think that masturbation and self-touch is such a powerful tool and a powerful resource, especially as a woman. And a lot of it probably stems from my students. Um, so everything my students tell me, it's, uh, it's a vault. It's a very sacred uh, space. And I've just heard so many people come in to the studio or in private sessions and in um, like our open talk spaces and express to me their frustrations with their body, their frustrations sexually, um, their lack of sexual fulfillment, their lack of desire. They've never had um, like an orgasm with or without a partner, just various, various statements that have been made to me. And not many places can you openly talk about sex to the depth that we can in the pole community. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely take advantage of that because the relationship that I have with my very few friends who don't poll, um, I don't really <laughs> talk about those types of things. I don't talk about sex as much with them. Um, yeah. Mostly because I have, and it's just like, well, this is really inappropriate. Um, <laughs> you know? There she goes so, again. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I feel like it's just such a freeing, open, accepting community that mm -hmm. it's one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about, but I, uh, I give permission, I guess I give them permission, even though I don't think that they need it. But sometimes if that's what they're waiting for, then it's there. Yeah. I don't think that they need it. I'm not empowering them to, um, they're owning their power and we're just enabling and allowing them to step into their own sexual, um, sense, their own sexual self. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm you you go through mobilizing your pelvis and the pelvis is such like mm -hmm. this sacred place for sexual expression that when you're mobilizing your pelvis like things get juicy they feel good that naturally carry <laughs> over into your regular life or your sex life you know you walk yeah. with like a little more sway or you mobilize your pelvis more so um i'm all about mobilizing the pelvis and like doing a body scan, checking in with yourself, because all of those things in pole carry over to real life. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I love I love this. Um, this gets me thinking. Um, maybe hearing some more cynical or more conservative <clears throat> people who, if they've made it this far and want to continue listening. Um, you know, they might be thinking, well, this, this, that's still something that is very private that needs to be kept yeah. indoors or something like that. And I kind of want to like, just, just kind of spew this out for a moment that <clears throat> like, first and foremost, sex creates, you know, it's like, I mean, I, <laughs> I <laughs> or we might not be here without <laughs> exactly none of us. Yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah. So first and foremost, and, and, you know, life is life is all that we have. Um, it's just plain yeah. and simple. And then at the other extreme, um, you know, we, just to say this explicitly, we pollers, we do have a lot to owe to people in strip clubs who are working with polls, who, who made all of this, you know, just possible for me to even think about doing this on my own. But a lot of us aren't ready for that. Like, I am not trying to be in a G-string and things that yeah. only cover my nipples in a room full of whoever wants to, like, look at my naked body. Yeah. So somewhere yeah. in the middle <laughs> of those two extremes, we have all of this area of, of exploration and, like, flirtation mm -hmm. and, um, you know, 
how we can even get from one to the other. And this is why this is so important, um, you know, philosophically. Like, you know, I'm a person you know, very similar to, to most students that we've come across, or even you. It's like, I've got stuff pent up. I have experiences from the past that are trapped in parts of my body. Um, you know, anybody who's had just a knot in their shoulder, like that was stress. Like, it's the same thing, but dealing with sex or something. Yeah in that realm so um to be able to go to a studio a literal space physical space in the world that is not going to harm you where people yeah. aren't going to be judging you where people basically don't give a shit what you're doing as long as you're not going to kill yourself yeah um and to explore that all that stuff in the middle is really powerful and yeah. really fucking cool um <laughs> so it's like i always admire <laughs> you all the more like you ladies who stay in that space <laughs> <laughs> and you put on heels and you put on tassels kinds of things yeah. um, because it looks like so, so 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 much fun but you know the little times if you're ever able to tap into that just for a day just for a class just for you know a season of your life like you won't regret it it just feels so good and it's yeah. so it awakens things it's like you get to know yourself a bit more. Mm -hmm. I think so and <laughs> that the like safe space that's non-harming it's very rare to come across that where yeah. you don't have your guard up and you're worried about xyz happening and you are being um like a sexual being you're owning your your sensuality or sexuality whatever you want to tap into the only other space that I've felt that for myself uh was actually with my teacher Shiva so I had done a lot of yoga before I found Shiva and some of it tapped into sex um but not in the way that she did not in this like joy orgasmic bliss like her face I just feel like she's just in this constant orgasmic so much of creation yeah um and just the energy and power that she has it's not um I think so many people are scared of like your sexual energy is gonna penetrate me like I mean, maybe <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> But like, that's not really how it works. But just yeah. her, her sexual energy was so strong. And she did talk about movement and the pelvis and how sex is part of creation. And it's part of tending your heart fire that I think that really solidified uh, that desire I had within me to know that like, this is home, like this mm. movement, whether it's off a pole, on a mat, off a mat, wherever it is, like this movement and that like orgasmic energy, that's home to me. Um, mm. And I, I find that like, it's a state of bliss. So orgasming is a state of bliss. And for someone who's experienced a fuck ton of trauma in their life, I mm. love bliss. Um, Cause those, uh, those like big heavy clouds tend to follow some of us around more than others. So if I can find moments of joy where there's more sun in my life, then I'm going to find them, whether it's through movement or sex or like food or wine, all of the like really cool indulgent things. I love all that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I think it's because maybe I'm a Taurus or something. I don't know. Yeah. I like all of like the desires. I like those things. <laughs> I want to talk a bit more about um about yoga and, and not necessarily the physical stuff but more yeah. what it does for you internally you what know, it has done for you yeah. <laughs> um, you know um why <clears throat> why you how you found it why you keep with it and yeah what it does for you yeah so I found yoga in school, actually, um, where I mean, I had experienced and seen and was exposed to yoga before, but I started practicing yoga in, uh, gosh, I think I was 15. So what is that? I was like a freshman, like freshman in know. school, like ninth grade. I don't know. Uh, so I think I found yoga in ninth grade and it was an elective. So you had to pick an elective awesome. and they didn't have dance. Um, 
and I wanted to move and yoga was the closest thing to that. And I think most people took it to like nap <laughs> and get the car and not have to do an elective. And I took it to be super serious because I never got to dance growing up. So yoga was, uh, we didn't have like the money and resources and time. So yoga was an outlet for me to move. And I remember they did dancers pose and I just felt uh, everything. I just got tunnel vision just to like me and the instructor. And I just felt that like, vroom, that drop mm -hmm. into that like exhale. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh we're here okay that was one of those like this is what you've been looking for and I got that mm. feeling how so I grew up horseback riding on a horse farm and when you take a jump for me it was just like lights out tunnel vision nothing else exists you hear your heart you feel all that energy it was mm. another uh it was that replicated and the same thing with pole replicated so mm. that's how I found yoga and then I just bought like DVDs. <laughs> I ordered DVDs. I ordered Shiva's DVDs. Uh, <laughs> when I looked, they were the first ones to come up. So I ordered yeah. Shiva's DVDs and it was more like dancey and fluid, very flow based. Um, yeah. And I had no idea what the hell was happening or the, the depth of her sequencing and the philosophy that went into her personal practice. Um, it was just really fun and cool. And I got to move and it was something else to do. Um, and then when I was 18, I booked a two day yoga training and drove up, drove like six hours North and booked like a Hojo, like a Howard Johnson hotel <laughs> and first trip away from home. And my mom was so scared. And I was like, I'm going to be a yoga teacher. Um, and I did it and just fell in love, talked to everyone. And I was not a big talker. Talking to strangers gave me the worst anxiety. I had like no self-esteem. I was in a constant state of panic attack because life was like after me uh, and mm -hmm. yoga took that away and I became obsessed and then started teaching and like one thing after the next, I needed more and more and more. Then I did my 200 hour training and it was a course that was just an exposure to, I don't know, like 12, 14, 15 different styles. Um, mm. And there were two instructors that I really gravitated towards. And I liked the way that they moved. I liked their cueing, the language that they used with their classes. Um, and the sequence was very different. It was more freeing and creative. And I said, okay, cool. Like, who's your instructor? Because I need to go to them. <laughs> like, I need mm -hmm. to go to your teacher to go do more. I need like my 500 hour. And they were just right across the river uh, in Maryland one of them. So I went from Maryland uh, and flew out to like Santa Monica for my 500 hour with Shiva, Ray and Maria Gare. And they're like my teacher teachers. Um, the, the way that they, the essence of who they are is so deeply rooted into their practice because they live their practice on their physical, below the surface it's all encompassing and it's who they are and I admired that um just their dedication and then once I started the style I understood like oh wow yoga is a lot more than asana who <laughs> were such a physical practice um yeah or on the opposite like not enough physical practice but mm -hmm. this was physical practice philosophy um Ayurveda so like the science of why we're doing this what it's tapping into and mm -hmm. that has shaped who I am as an observer in classes with pole and just life in general and being able to guide but then witness people's movements and their mm -hmm. own experiences within their body so yoga has given me so much uh just yoga has given me the ability to tap into things I could never identify in myself and then also other people. So some of my students joke, especially I think since I had a baby, that I have this like uncanny ability to identify certain things in them. So movement's movement. And if you watch people move after a while, you can identify, oh, like you are possibly a rock climber 
or like you could be a swimmer or a runner. So I'll take a stab in the dark when I meet people the first time. They're like, oh, do you do this? And most, uh, most of the time I'm pretty spot on. Like one, I was like, oh, you're a triathlete. That even shocked me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the same thing. If you walk into the room and I feel this like dark energy, I can pretty much sense where it's coming from. Um, and then I know, oh, we need a whole different experience for class today. And that's all mm. from yoga, like the sequencing, mm -hmm. the movement prompts, um, like the qualities, all of that, like qualities, textures, movement prompts. This is something I feel like the pole community is really, really pushing um, masses. So more people are doing it now. It's always been there because it's part of dance. It's not new. Um, mm -hmm. But all of that for me came from yoga years ago because you mm. for Prana Flow um, is the style. It's the school that Shiva has. Uh, part of the Ayurvedic course is to identify all of that. So you identify like the gunas and the qualities of things. And then your sequencing, your sequencing is all prompt based. It's all season based. Um, so it's this whole other world of yoga that I had no idea existed. And it was just so beautiful because you, you labeled things but it was just that's what it is it wasn't like a dirty label that society has placed on you it's like we're gonna do this flow because it taps into the time of day into the season into the day of the week into like you're feeling anxiety or you want to open up like your heart center like there was such a reason to it that I needed the reason to find the calm versus just we're existing through asana because mm -hmm. you say so that's mm -hmm. but I needed a reason for the calm yeah. and then that just translated to pole because I still my brain is too busy on the mat it still is like <laughs> yeah it takes me a long time with yoga like to get back into uh that like white noise being gone yeah. but with pole something about that steel pipe like hitting my skin just like snaps me <laughs> like into like a this uh just current state of being yeah. yeah. Nothing will take yeah. you away from thinking about like the dread and worry and stress of life, like being scared mm -hmm. to fall on your face. Oh <laughs> like, my God. You know, like there's no time <laughs> for doubt and for fear. There's just no time for it. You cannot no fucking guess it. yourself. You have to have this focus. Yeah. And it's uh, the eye of the storm when I dance, when I'm, when I pull, it is the eye of the storm. And yoga is whatever is outside of the eye of the storm. Close, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> does that make you get a storm <laughs> actually like yeah yoga i don't know i came like part of my life and ran away to a retreat center in costa rica so because of yoga one time so i think yoga created uh, like some hurricane in my life for a season yeah, yeah. so knowing i think yeah you know, what your opinion on this knowing everything that you know knowing what you know now everything about yoga and, and yeah. all is what you were just explaining. Why? How do I want to say this? So this is this is like I, I want to save the world, and I feel like it's through either yoga or pole <laughs> or philosophy <laughs> or like dance, something like that. One of these things. But if people knew all of this stuff, either about pole or yoga, it's gonna unlock some really cool shit with you. Yeah. Um, why do you think people are still so resistant to doing one or the other? Um, <laughs> many, <laughs> many, many reasons. I could give you, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> the, quickest, the quickest answer would be, uh, for me, effort is required. And you have to want it more than the effort. So, mm. For me, mm -hmm. I wanted, I was seeking and I wanted something more than it hurt, more than it was hard, more than the challenge. So effort is required and it's kind of like a make or break, but you can always come back to it because you might not be ready. Uh, mm. and it's really scary to be, I could only imagine I've always been deeply connected to like the sensations that are arising in me. Um, I could only imagine how scary that would be to not have that connection and then have mm. the floodgates open on you. Um, mm -hmm. 
and then you just lose your footing and you lose your surface. And I think that uh, people's nervous systems are fried. I think they're fried, they're overstimulated because of like technology. And we want this instant gratification and everything needs to happen so fast um, that you won't find that at pole and you won't find that at yoga. There's effort is required and it's not instant and it's a challenge. Um, and then on the other side, I've seen people pull for years, for years that are on like the cusp of breakthroughs. And then they just leave because I think they're not ready for it. I think the timing in their life uh, wasn't right. We weren't the right studio for them or wherever they were, wasn't the right studio, or right environment for them, for that to happen. Um, so effort is required and you have to be ready. And if you're not ready, then you better fucking hang on uh, and figure out how to get ready really quick. So yeah, yeah. it's hard. I like that. I've tried other stuff, like uh, I've tried to cycle. I didn't like mm -hmm. it enough to keep going more than mm -hmm. maybe like five or 10 times. I've tried so many other things. I've taught so many formats. Um, I just didn't like them enough. So I think so, yeah, it's just, it's quite odd. I did one Muay Thai private and I liked the violence of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. The and my husband even said, he was like, you need to do something violent, babe. <laughs> I liked the violence of it. Um, and like the narrative that my coach painted, I was like, this is similar to pull. Pull, pull to me is controlled chaos and it's this calm violence. Mm -hmm. um, like you're throwing your body on a pipe and you're ripping your skin off yeah. and dropping. Yeah. Like even just being on your knees, grinding them into the floor, you're wearing these crazy yeah. ass heat. It doesn't feel good. It's chaos, it's violent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's around. Twisting around the pole yesterday, thinking like, "Why am I doing this?" Oh, and yeah, look in the mirror. Oh, yeah, because it's really pretty. Yeah, I go, it looks good. Yeah, if it fucking hurts, it probably looks awesome. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it just hurts a lot. Okay, cool. Take a picture. <laughs> you know? Or like, also like, picture that moment. Take a picture of uh, the energy you're feeling in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Chase that. That like, <laughs> oh, that sense of like accomplishment. I guess, but that sense of like, I did that. My body can do that. The sense of your yeah. own power. Yeah. I don't get that through cycle or Pilates. And I'm not talking shit about them. It just, that does not do it for me. I'm sure for right. some people, they're like uh, Tour de France, you know, on their bike. Right. That's not, hell no. I'm like, my vagina is getting impacted <laughs> in the seat and my labia are not okay with this. I need a no thing. The lady yeah. does not cool with it. Right. But then also we're smushing our labia on the pole too. Like genitals go on to like with some stuff. Right. Yeah. And that's actually what I meant to bring up like probably 30 minutes ago. As an instructor um, or a coach, especially of any of any dance form, of any anything athletic where you're you're getting up close and personal with people. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. we have to talk about body parts and we mm -hmm. have to talk about the sensitive body parts. Yeah. Because it's like, hey, yeah. <laughs> you don't want you know your labia to be smashed into the pole yeah. guys you don't want your your nutsack to get like twisted yeah. up in this move like no this is why very quickly we have to be very open yeah. with each other you know we can make jokes about it but it's like I'm gonna tell you real quick like if we're you're gonna smash your fanny yeah. <laughs> and you're gonna it's regret it like this I'm like yeah I have one client she loves moves they're like all labia crushers and I'm like okay you ready uh, okay <laughs> you know what to do <laughs> because yeah. they're all split like like smushed twisted splits and they're just so pretty and yeah uh, uh, pull what i love about pull is that uh you know day one newbies they walk in i did the same thing i brought a whole bag i did not mm -hmm. know what to wear it was mm -hmm. like almost 13 years ago and uh day one it was like a tank top and shorts this fucking big you know <laughs> <laughs> and now i look back I'm like oh god I don't even think I own shorts that long anymore. No. Yeah. No. no. And then, you know, you need more skin. The more, the longer you pull, when you do certain shapes, you do need more skin. You need more points of contact. So it's this natural process of um, revealing your body. And mm. now it's very different. I think that uh, social media is, is done a lot as far as body positivity goes. Um, especially in the whole community, um, mm -hmm. that 
there's not so much hesitation now from uh, people feeling overexposed and uncomfortably vulnerable when they come to the studio being asked to wear shorts and a tank top or shorts and whatever. When before I would be like, okay, I'm going to take scissors and I'm going to cut your yoga pants. It's time. Oh my God. Yeah. Or I would, I would, I would give someone shorts. I'm like, you know what? I know that this is, I know this is huge for you, but it's time. Like these are yours now. You better wear these next class because they're free. So wear them. And then they do. And then they never, like they burn. I hope they burn their other stuff. You know, they just don't come back with it. Um, and it's not like the clothes, the clothes don't make you, you make what you're wearing. So being comfortable with your body, especially my body, like pre boob job competitor to then boob job to then having a baby. Oh Lord, my body is probably like, I don't know, 30 pounds fluctuated between all of those stages. Um, so things that I used, things that I would never wear, I'm wearing now or things that like vice versa so but I still I love my body I'm super comfortable with my body it's just in a different phase and it's more squishy but sex feels the best it's ever felt so I don't really care <laughs> yeah which leads me to back to the existential dilemmas um so what I wrote down was love parenting and identities and you can take it yeah. where the hell you want um but for sure you know that I don't want to say that's what I think of when I look at you that like you <laughs> just be frank pre-boob job boob job mom like because just physically like yeah. that you know I've always basically been this size like I am probably today sitting at like 151 like my highest that I've been is 160 the lowest 141 like I don't even know what it's like to be squishy like I I'm looking yeah. forward to getting like fat and happy like I want to see that myself I want to look in the mirror and be like oh my god I got high you know because I just I don't even know what that feels like and so yeah. I think that that I know that you know from like personal training clients that I've had like that fluctuation can really fuck you up yeah. in your head and so you know this is my identity whether I like it or not whether I accept that or not and I don't know how that could be a for you in your yeah. mind like oh my body's different now because I chose it or because I chose it yeah, right? <laughs> uh. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I would feel like a fraud if I, if I, well, like two sides, I would feel like a fraud if I was like, I love my body 100% to the T how it is right now. And then I would also feel like a fraud if I didn't love my body, because that's what I base my business and my career off of. So mm -hmm. I've had to have a lot of like, uh, real hard conversations with myself. So before boob job, um, so I, I have a history of eating disorder. So I was, I dabbled with like anorexia and bulimia, trying to figure out like I have commitment issues, right? So trying to figure out what the hell I was gonna do. And it happened to be uh, bulimia because I love food. Like I just, I can't not eat. That's just not my thing. And then I developed a healthy relationship with my body and food because of pole. And I realized you can't be binging and throwing up and not having energy if you're gonna throw yourself around a pole and go upside down. So you have to be strong. So being strong and not having not having the energy and like seeing stars when I'm up there because uh, <laughs> of what I was doing to my body. Yeah. Like it made me change everything really fast. So mm. uh, then my body started changing more, like I got more muscular and that was fine. Like I loved it, whatever. But then because of that, my boobs went away. Um, and I had like almost D's uh, and then they just turned, it looked like I had already been breastfeeding by the time I was mm -hmm. like in my early twenties. Cause I had just lost so much breast tissue. Um, mm -hmm. so like my first heavy round of competitions, uh, I think looking back, I'm like, oh, that was my perfect body. But also I was not like perfectly happy. My husband mm -hmm. and I were like on round two of like, okay, are we going to get separated? What are we doing? Like, we moved to a new state. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do here. Um, and then I got my boob job and I gained weight. And then I was dealing with like, wow, my whole structure has changed because I have these huge boobs now. Okay. Mm. And then <laughs> I got, and then I didn't lose like the boob job weight. And then I got pregnant and I love being pregnant. I love being pregnant. I was so happy when I was pregnant. Like 
it didn't really bother me. Uh, I thought about stretch marks and was um, concerned, I guess, or aware of like, oh, that could happen. Um, but yeah, like I have some stretch marks now on like the tops of my thighs and like uh, the sides of my hips. But uh, no, this body, it doesn't always, I know it's home, but it doesn't always feel like mine. Cause I know mm -hmm. I've lived in a different body for so long. Like I've mm -hmm. lived in a different body for so long and I don't have me time to train anymore. So I'm disconnected from uh, being able to engage and actually feel my structure mm -hmm. from having the baby um, that I know it's home and I know this is my body and I'm so proud of it. And I, I know I'm still crazy strong for what I can mm -hmm. do. It's just, I can't do the same stuff anymore. And yeah. long-term breastfeeding. Um, I know everyone says, oh, you lose weight when you breastfeed. Cool. But not when you breastfeed for two years, like we're going <laughs> on two plus, like two years, two months or something right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so and my friends who have done it, they're just like, if you haven't lost it by now, it's probably not going to go away until you start breastfeeding. Like I got my thyroid tested, had all this blood work done. I lost all this hair. I'm still losing hair. So this, uh, this crisis of who am I? And then mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's something that I've just moved on from because I still mm -hmm. move. I still love pole. Uh, my body will be what it's going to be. And I'm sure as hell I'm not going to diet for aesthetic because then the mindset of that goes back to the mindset that I was at when I was, uh, when I had eating disorder. So I won't alter my body. Um, I won't alter my body <laughs> from a certain mindset. <laughs> this was yeah. a very conscious okay. question. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So from like a certain mindset, I think it's unhealthy, but like whatever you want to do with your body, it's your body. You want a boob job, go get a boob job. If it makes you happy yeah. with pole though, I, I can't do the same stuff. So right. <laughs> I think I, I think I did a fondue way too soon after I had my implants and now I get like imagine the worst Charlie horse, but it's it's under it's under my implant. So anytime that like uh, anytime I'm doing any breast monkey something, even like rolling over and reaching across my body, my implant gets stuck and there's a Charlie horse. So oh my god, that's so weird to imagine. <laughs> yeah. So I like I can't when I'm teaching I can't demo the same stuff anymore because it's just yeah. it's excruciating. And I get stuck and there's nothing I can do about it right now because I'm still breastfeeding. So I can't yeah. like get them removed or redone mm -hmm. or whatever until baby's done. And I asked him like, can we stop breastfeeding soon? And he said, no, and put his hand over my mouth. And he was like, no, so I was like, okay, cool. Um, timeline. <laughs> it's his journey. Yeah. I'm like, She's thinking another couple months, another year. Okay, so can we reschedule this meeting when we're going to discuss this again? You're going to come back yeah. to this? And I asked him the next day too, and he was just like, no. <laughs> and it's it's his journey, not mine. Like, yes, it's my body, but yeah. it's his journey. And he's only little for such a short amount of time that like when he's done, he'll be done. Um, if I get yeah. to a certain place like mentally where I actually need to be done, then yeah. that would be different. Um, cause yeah. first and foremost, he needs a happy mom and he needs a happy mom. I can't sit here and wallow over, uh, none of my freaking clothes fit. Oh my gosh. That's why I dress like a hippie. I'm like, that's where <laughs> I always get dressed. So, I love, um, I love what you said about, you know, making decisions from a certain mindset, like yeah. as long as we do that, then it's okay. Um, because I mean, I think that that definitely applies to whether we're talking about like boob jobs or eating like an entire case of Oreo cookies. Like if that's what you want to do and that's what is going to like resolve whatever, like genuinely resolve whatever, yeah. it's gonna make you happy, then do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if and you know I've that had, you're not like, just like the healthy. eating thing for sure. I um I tend to be a little more aware of where it's coming from just because of my uh bulimia. Um yeah. so I know that. I eat because I have control issues. There was no control. There was no stability in my life growing up. So I want to find ways to give myself stability um, mm -hmm. and control because when the world is in a downward shit spiral, uh, mm -hmm. I can control X, Y, Z. So 
yeah, there are times where I'm like, wow, okay, cool. Like that definitely was not a conscious choice or that was definitely like uh, self-care. No, that was masked and you're like feeding your trauma and you're masking it as like self-care. Um, but it's really scary to do that too. Cause then I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, then I have to do something about it. Yeah. Now I have to do something about it. Yeah. yeah. And I don't mean like go work out and like, oh fuck, I have to analyze where that came from and why I did Right. It. So it's not the unhealthy again or not turn yeah. this into an unhealthy spiral because you yeah. know. And I'm like, blah, why? Blah, blah, blah. I wish, you know, I know some people don't feel that. Like my husband, he's not that pretty. Like he's not that person. He has very steady emotions. And the only time I've really seen that man have anxiety was like right after a baby was born. And he was like, I feel something. <laughs> I was like, babe, that's emotions. <laughs> I literally, I looked at him and I said, babe, you doing okay? He was like, yeah, I just feel something and I don't know what it is. And I was like, it's called emotions, babe. And you probably have a little bit of anxiety. And he was like, ew, you deal with this all the time. I was like, every damn day. And he was like, oh my shit. God. Yeah, and you know Chris, so he was. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris, but that's funny as hell. I know, I was like, babe, that's what I feel all of the time, like 24, almost seven. What are you talking about? And he was like, yeah, I've never yeah. felt that before. Like, oh my God. Can I tell you? So like the closest thing that I've experienced with that as far as like really significant, like calculable, <laughs> can be quantified kind of thing is like after my hysterectomy where like, you know, like I was being so driven, my actions, my activities, my thinking were like driven by, oh my God, am I going to be bleeding today? I'm going to be in pain yeah. today. Just like all of that. And then to like have that just gone, like for a solid year or two, and even now and then, like now I was just like, is this how guys feel? Where like their lives and emotions don't get interrupted on a monthly or semi-monthly basis? Like, is that what this is? <laughs> It's, yeah that's really funny you say that because he said the same thing I'm like I don't know why I feel this way and like da, 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 da. he was like are you close to your period and that's like we joke that that's his thing for everything because when I am getting close to my cycle uh, yeah. my emotions do fluctuate because now and I'm coming off of uh, an IUD so my body is trying to regulate itself and uh he's just like babe you're not on the IUD anymore and I'm like what the fuck I'm gonna go back on because what is this what am I feeling because I didn't yeah. feel that it was different the IUD was more like rage I was like why am I angry but now I'm like the world's falling apart oh my god we're super emo. like yeah I'm like there's they're starving babies right now how we like we have to give Those them money. your hormones <laughs> I know. Unfettered. <laughs> Raw. This is all you leave. I know. I just sucks. I know last night I was like, okay, we have to find an organization. We watched this movie and it turned into this like, oh my God, like, how do we get people clean water? And he was like, it's 1130 at night. We're going to bed. Go to sleep. I was like, no, I have to get online and find an organization that has like very, very low admin overhead and find a way to give them water so they can build a well. Yeah. Oh like, my God. Wow. Water, babe. And he was just like, it's too late for this shit. Babe. Go to bed. <laughs> and I was, he I was snoring. And then he was up like, just like wired watching Mandalorian on his phone because he didn't want to wake us up. <laughs> yeah. But no, I'm like, yeah. we need to give them clothes. Like this, the, the yeah. time, you know, or that realization yeah. of, I'm sitting here like with my Brita filter, you know? Yeah. So I try to give myself constant reality checks when I get in those like hormonal places and want to complain about stuff or life or my body. I'm like, okay, you are fine. Yeah. You are fed. You are happy. You are safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh my God. Lord, that, that's a whole other conversation of just like the <clears throat> being able to take that being able to step outside of ourselves or beside ourselves or just raise a mirror and be like, nope, this is what's actually going on. You are safe. You are healthy. You, you know, are okay. Like I'm worrying about my pulse <laughs> video right now. I'm like, okay, at least I have my business still. We're outside. I still have people showing up because we love pole. We need pole. It's not just, it's not just pole for us. It's pole, you know? Mm -hmm. So there are people who have no resources who have no roof over their head, who have nothing. Um, so when I like, 
very rarely has anyone complained uh but we had like one email and it's for when we had moved from the rooftop down and the person like was just so nasty and like not understanding and was like I wanted the rooftop I want to schedule a rooftop class when can you do that for me and I'm like okay one the roof is cold now at night the stages are rusting because it's getting wet and the dew and condensation are ruining it I've spent like twelve thousand dollars buying equipment to set all of this up and everything so they're also super heavy and I have to carry them up two flights of, not me Christopher has to carry them up to the roof I did some of it uh yeah no I'm not just hauling ass all the way back up there to set up a class for you because you wanted to take pictures with the rooftop background let alone I'm yeah. trying to keep my business from crumbling uh and keep my sanity and also like not have broken humans on the other side of this so mm-hmm. my interest is not with you one-time client who is coming my interest mm-hmm. is with the people who use this as their temple and their sanctuary who need this and you may not like the decisions that I'm making but I'm making decisions for our longevity not like mm-hmm. day-to-day because yeah I'm just like whoa okay cool but then that tells me that person really 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 needed some type of connection and movement right. moment in their life and I'm sorry I couldn't give it to you picture perfect how you wanted but I hope you find that you know yeah yeah, yeah. um so talking about existential dilemmas talk about like being different bodies um and now you bring up um you know I don't want to say having different personalities dealing with different personalities yeah that's what we were you know discussing and um okay just want to frame this in some people don't want to change because they don't know what it will be like to be a different person yeah um don't know what it will be like to have firmer boundaries and they don't know they're they just don't know either or they're afraid or it's it's something to them um being happier (laughs) getting more joy out of life kind of thing so um as somebody with a strong personality who (laughs) you've got, you know, most of the time you've got your priorities, um, whether that is business or personal, emotional, whatever that might be. Um, You know, you won't ever offend me, just say it. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Um, I think it's just, you know, can you just speak on that? how, How you deal with that, how you navigate that kind of existentialism of just being a powerful, person like I know that you say this and you laugh when I say I'm not I don't think that I'm like a powerful strong person I just am who I am because I'm a product of my past and Mm -hmm. doing the work to work beyond that um so now how I approach things is very very different than how I'd approach them even yesterday so I think the biggest thing for me um I have my hard nose and I I definitely have my boundaries so until we get to that point whether it's whatever type of relationship or communication I'm having with, with someone um I tend to stay pretty open when it comes to the studio versus like um my family life or my own personal life those boundaries some have way more give than others so with my son uh those boundaries are very 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 hard um and that wall is very far beyond myself uh so with him and his happiness and protecting him those boundaries are very concrete uh with the studio they come in a lot more because you're dealing the studio and pole, like it is a business, um, but it's not always the like the sense of like professionalism as far as like the back end side of the studio interacting with the front side. It's not always there because it's a very emotional community. Um, mm-hmm. And which is, that's a byproduct of what we're pushing or I'm pushing in classes. It's like tap into your emotions. What are you feeling? So, well, fuck, I just asked you to feel your emotions. Now you're going to tell me, okay, cool. <laughs> you better be ready to handle that. Um, mm. And that 
is so key for me is you better be ready to handle, especially if you're going to come work for me. It's a very different side. Um, you're not going to get instructor me. Like I'll still hold your hand and I will help you. And I want you doing what you love, but now you're responsible for every person that's in your class, for every person that's going to sign up in your class. So I'm going to hold you to a certain standard because now you are responsible for their body. And it's not just, oh, like, I don't want people to think that we're the studio that injures people. No, it's, you're going to injure someone and that's going to affect their life. Like, you don't know what they do for a living. They right. you don't know if they have to go pick up their dog every day or they have to pick up their son. Like, you don't know how that injury is going to impact their life. Um, so I'm very, very strict with like my boundaries with uh, <clears throat> my staff. And if you haven't come from working in an environment like that, then it could be uh, like, it, it could be a hard pill to swallow because I do mm -hmm. reviews. I'm going to sit in like, I don't care. We're doing like any year staff reviews. Um, people have been working with me for like four years versus now they're coming up on four weeks. Like everyone's getting the same. Um, so the boundaries are different. And then you have to think like, here's your boundary. What season am I going through right now? What am I experiencing in my life? That's going to make me more sensitive or desensitized. And then the same thing for that other person, because there's sides to every story. And what I've learned is that what you're experiencing in that moment definitely influences what's happening in your life and how, uh, how you will communicate that to someone, what your reaction and response will be to them. So I do a lot of like uh, delete. <laughs> I do a lot mm. of deleting because there's just my initial response of like, blah, 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 from writing a text or an email. And then I sit back, I'm like, okay, like what does this person probably need in this moment? How can I tailor this response to them? Um, mm. Which I maybe always didn't do that before because I just, uh, was just running a business and I was doing so much more stuff and there wasn't time. It was just like, this is me. Okay, cool. And I'm like, no, like I'm actually, I'm here to make a space for you. And that also comes down to the power of words um, mm -hmm. and the words that I'm using with you and how I'm approaching you. And you can trigger someone in a way that you don't even realize. And once they've been triggered, it's really hard to get that back. Uh, yeah. So when that happens, I know that like, I just, I can't control everything and I can't take responsibility for everyone's emotions. Um, yeah. And if people want to talk about things, awesome, great. Come to me, talk with me. I'll tell you why X, Y, Z happened. Cause there is a curtain and no one sees what's behind that. Cause everything is for the studio, the longevity of the studio, the success of the studio, really the success. It's not it's not ego driven. Like we need three studios and blah, blah, blah. And to be like the Yelp read, like, fuck that. It's not what it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, the success of the studio is like uh, the success of our clients being connected with themselves and not running away from life when they need it yeah. in the studio. And if you can't show up as an instructor and do that, then like, we don't have success. If I can't show up as Sirik's mom and do that, then I don't have success. So success is not like measured by mm -hmm. uh, our sales or our Yelp ratings or like what other people think I am or what role I feel as like a mom or a wife, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially with Chris dealing with, Chris deals with me very well, deals with me. He, uh, <laughs> He, he loves you. He yeah. He's married to you. He's very, <laughs> your friend. Yeah, exactly. He, uh, the passion is like what's appealing to him, I think. So the mm -hmm. fact that like I am who I am and I have my thoughts and opinions and like that crazy Latina that, uh, you know, other people just couldn't deal with. He, he like laughs at me when I'm mad. So it's really hard to stay mad at him. Um, mm -hmm. So like my strong personality, he, that's part of the reason why he loves me is because I'm not uh, the opposite of who I am. I am who I am and that's mm. ever changing and he's ever adapting to that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, my family has done that really well. Um, the studio has kept up with that because when I have a creative idea, that means like the whole freaking studio has a creative idea and yeah. we go with it now. So yeah. cool. <laughs> I tell you, as your friend, what I hear from that, what I feel from that, and what I've always <clears throat> just kind of embraced from, from what you're saying is that um, 
you know, we, first of all, be who you are. Yeah. Um, secondly, decide who you want to be. And I think usually those are switched, but, you know, it depends on the day. And I really like that. It depends on the season. Um, and then also really understand that who we are to other people, of course, it's none of our business, but who we are to other people might also be what they need. Yeah. So if, if, if I have to be the person who doesn't lie, who, who doesn't like let shit fly, then all right, that's, that's who, maybe that's, that's what that person needs in their life. That's the puzzle piece yeah. that I'm playing. They you might know, not still, want it though, and then you yeah, become want it. <laughs> or you become like a bitch, which to be honest, yeah. I'm totally fine. <laughs> I'm fine being that person because from like being like a strong or like powerful person or woman, that's not, yeah. I never act from a place of like malice and I'm never acting from a place to hurt someone. Um, right. I definitely might be more tough love, but if you need me to not be, I can flip the switch in a second and I will, well, outside of COVID times, I'll fucking give you a boob hug. Like come here, yeah. heart center, <laughs> like breathe. I am with you. I have you. You don't have to work, just be. But yeah. when, when people react from emotions versus like the logic of you and them uh you that's where you get like oh like you're a bitch or you're this or like that like you wanted to hurt me on purpose like all that type of stuff that's never Mm -hmm. like that's never what it is so Mm -hmm. yeah and I have an open door like oh always open line of communication all the time might take a little bit longer for me to get back to you because just life and baby um but when people actually need me to be there I am and if I'm not call me out call me out on my shit and tell me so then I can know better and I can do better yeah Yeah. (laughs) life's just hard (laughs) life is just hard relationships are hard yeah running a business is hard like everything it's just hard yeah (laughs) that's what I was gonna say are there any final words that you have (laughs) yeah exactly and like you're on a new venture so you know like it's creative, but it's like, there's the unknown, it's challenging and how you, yeah, how you react to challenges right now in like this unknown are different than how you will or how anyone will when they've been doing things for years. Because, and I say this in class, I think like experience, expectation and exposures are all very closely related, but everyone's expectations are way up here. But mm. your mm to something and your experience with it is not going to be here it's all the way down here so if we mm-hmm. just drop our expectations I think that life would be more manageable but the human element uh is there so expectations <laughs> thank you <laughs> I, know. I don't know I mean, who needed to hear that about lowering the expectations <laughs> You know, like you don't have any experience or exposure to this. How are you expecting to be a rock star? Like for it to be easy or for it to be smooth? Like yeah. what are you talking about? No. Oh my god. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, my soul needed that right now. <laughs> but even though, even if you hear that, you're like, okay, yeah, but but this is different. Oh, but I'm different. Right. Yeah. You know, no. like oh, but yeah. no, no, and no, it's not. not. No, but like maybe, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> boob hug. <laughs> boob hug. I know. I've given you quite a few boob hugs. Maybe pre and post boob job. Yeah. Before it might have been like a sternum hug. <laughs> I love, I love sternum. you. Sternums are so freaking sexy. I know, like, people like, pretty much, I love sternum. Sternums are kind of my thing. I like it. Like, reading from and moving from your sternum, there's so much power yeah. in there. There is. That's one of the, that's definitely one of my, my cues that I love to give. It's like, lift your heart. Like if it's depending on who it's like, lift your sternum. Cause it just, it, you have to like, well, how do I do that? Like lead with it. And then everything falls back, falls away. Everything has to get out of the way. It's just, but you're uh, exposed when you do that yeah. and like uh, life and trauma and everything will block you up. So it's very hard for people to even like alter their structure to be here because they naturally have this guard and they're so closed off. So the freedom, that freedom that you give people, just that little cue, it's like bust your heart open. Don't just be here, like bust your heart open. Cause it's that like, I love this uh, reckless abandon because very rarely in life do you get that. 
Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> also, yellow is uh, my favorite color, and it is a sign, oh. and a color of joy and happiness and sun. And I love that you're wearing yellow right now. It makes me so happy. And then, like yellow with your smile and you know your cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> Today is a good day. Oh, today is a good day. You you have definitely made this day, helped make this day just wonderful. Thank you Thank for you. your time. Um, give yourself a hug for me and, and of course, everybody in the house. Yeah. Ah, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yay. Enjoy your Sunday. We're going to go grocery Oh, okay. I think I'm going to go in the yard and do some yoga because the sun's nice and warm. So, <laughs> yeah. <Bye again. laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Yeah, as I told you, this is the mixed chick, y'all ladies. This is just, oh, <laughs> so happy. <laughs>